Well, hello, hello everyone. The last time I was in Berlin, it was a little sunnier, but thank you, thank you all for uh, coming out uh, today, and uh, thanks for uh, everyone for having me at the conference. Um, I want to talk today, uh, and I'm just going to not read my paper, but just use the uh, use my PowerPoint, and then we can go back to it if it's anything you want to the discussion. Um, I, in my program, uh, advise doctoral students some, and uh, we have a number of students who are interested in kind of hardcore philosophy, and analytic philosophy, or Kant, or whatever, and a lot of others who are interested in cultural theory and in media studies and so forth. And uh, I have been preparing myself for the day when I have a student that comes in and asks me this. Uh, as my advice, somebody says, it, would it be all right if I design a video game and submit that as my dissertation? Now, that's a bit more complicated question than it sounds. At first, one might say, well, and I particularly think people, maybe people in, in this room uh, might say, well, you know, why not? Um, and yet, uh, I think if I presented that all of our dissertations have to go through the graduate dean, Descant, I think you call them here. And uh, very often you might get this response, not only from the Descant, uh, but from also many of my colleagues, the more analytic persuasion, I would say. And uh, they would say, oh, you can't, you can't submit a video game as a dissertation. That would not be philosophy any longer. And I wanted to before I had this student that come in, that comes in, and I think it's inevitable that it will happen, maybe in my lifetime before I retire, I'm not sure, uh, I wanted to be prepared. What would I say to her? And so I started thinking this through a little bit, and I wanted to pre present here to you where I came out with this, when, what, what I've finally decided I'd say, but I'll Leave it to the, I'll leave it to the exciting conclusion to let you know what I would tell them, and in the meantime, think through the matter a bit. So the first thing I want to just clarify here is, is what, this, what I think this student is actually asking me. That's important. And I want to distinguish between three different kinds of questions uh, that have to do with the relation of philosophy and computer games. And the first kind of question or issue that uh, I would say I call philosophy in computer games. And these would be examples where philosophy, uh, where, a com where there are traditional philosophical problems that most people uh, agree on and talk about a good bit often, and that get illustrated in video, in, in computer. We say video games at home, but I know you all say computer games, so excuse me if I, excuse me if I slip and say that. Uh, and so examples would be the Tranquility Lane episode, for example, in Fallout 3, incidentally one of my favorite games and I'm very much looking forward to 4, uh, and moral dilemmas uh, that were more somewhat pioneered, I guess, by the Bioshock series. So that's philosophy in computer games, known problems ex exemplified. Uh, I think Cogburn and Silcox's book is, is kind of an example, uses computer games like that. Now, the second thing that I distinguish are from what I call philosophy and computer games. And uh, these, are, these are questions, I think, that are not so much illustrated in computer games as that computer games raise new questions for philosophy that perhaps uh, weren't part of the uh, repertoire of philosophy, at least as the tradition unfolded. So they're new issues, things like, um, uh, artificial intelligence of NPCs and things like that. I don't think Plato thought much about that, uh, or Kant. Uh, avatars and the question of self-identity. These are kind of philosophy and video games in, in the sense of uh, video games as a medium, not necessarily particular ones, posing questions for philosophy. But it's the third question that I think my student's asking me about, and it's what I call philosophy as computer game. And I think this is the real question that my student is asking me. And uh, I, by the way, I saw uh, kind of reading on the way on the plane over here that you all had already had a conference on the 1st of October about uh, computer games. Is that right? Uh, a panel discussion or something? There's another one this afternoon. But, but was there already one in October on a theme kind of like this? 
Yeah, I wonder. Maybe not. It said October 1st, but I'm not sure. Well, it, well, in any event, I know that there are discussions going on. There will be some this afternoon, so I'm looking very much forward to seeing how, how, that, how these issues are treated there. So I think this is the question. So the, the program that I want to look at here will be, the, the first one will be, I want to look at uh, the, uh, remembering our dean and uh, with his uh, fairly salty language to us. <laughs> What are the prima, prima facie objections to my student's proposal based on the nature of computer games? I think my dean might have, think, might have thought something like this. Second is, what, are, what might be the prima facie objections uh, to uh, my student's proposal based on the nature of philosophy? A third kind of related question is, uh, that's received in the last decade or so some discussions uh, uh, and, and came up the other day too. Uh, computer, the, the, the line of discussion or reflection that goes uh, uh, has to do with computer games as art and as philosophy, and if that is a connection there that might be more supportive to the student's project than uh, objection. And um, then uh, I want to talk about a few philosophical devices in computer games that I think uh, I want to argue computer games may even do better than texts. Uh, or the, the traditional kind of philosophical text, and then uh, conclude with uh, talking about what, uh, what, what, I, what we would say to our student who came in with this request of presenting a, uh, presenting a computer game as a dissertation. All right, so let's start with the prima facie objections uh, that might be made on the basis of the nature of video games. And this is a fair, for, I think for most of you, most of you in here and for me, this is a really fairly short discussion. Uh, though my uh, dean, who I'm pretty sure uh, has never played a computer game in his life, uh, has little knowledge of it. I would, I, I, would, I would say that if somebody, let's say our dean as my foil, um, wants to object to and saying, well, computer games just aren't, uh, they're, they're games, they're frivolous, they're, uh, they can't be serious, philosophy is too serious a subject for that. I, we don't need to spend a lot of time, and I think I'd probably just point out to the dean or my uh, bulky uh, colleagues that if you, if you started, let's say, with Pac-Man or Pong or something, I think it would have been, I think it would be very, difficult to imagine the emergence uh, of something like The Last of Us. It would be, have been very, uh, using that as kind of a very sophisticated game, it would be very difficult to imagine. And so I don't see why we couldn't say at the same point, now, look, um, maybe, maybe, maybe computer games haven't you know, become fully philosophical yet, but uh, maybe if you look toward the future and look at their evolution, you might uh, think, well, gee, you know, how, how, how could we say that the, you know, the medium couldn't develop so that it may be even more sophisticated than that? So I, would so I, take, I take mostly ob obje objections, uh, prima facie objections about the nature of computer games to be probably likely those made mostly by people who don't know much about computer games and haven't followed the literature. So we can move on from this, but uh, come back to it if you want to. But I'm more interested now in, in objections based on the nature of philosophy. And um, I want to make a few points about, about this. Uh, mainly, I would say, less to my dean now than to the, my colleagues in philosophy who may be skeptical about uh, my student's proposal. Um, and although I think that philosophy and what the nature of philosophy is is, is very disputed these days, and I think one would have a, a hard time going to any philosophy conference uh, and finding a general consensus about what philosophy is, unless it was a very narrow one with relatively few uh, participants who simply read one another's work and thought they knew what philosophy was. In general, as the broad field, there's not a lot of agreement. But I think there, are the, the, from various sides, I think I would have some colleagues who would, who would have some general view like this that they would uh, give me as an objection. The first is that they would probably say to me, natural language, and some of them might say, and possibly it's symbolic you know, elements of 
formalization of natural language, is somehow the necessary medium of philosophy. And it certainly, of course, has been through most of the tradition. Um, associated with this would be several um, other views about what philosophy is, and I'll summarize them here. The, the, the fundamental tasks of philosophy, they might say to me, are first of all uh, to formulate propositions, usually expressed, taken to be expressed by sentences in natural language, although there's disagreement about that. Uh, secondly, that uh, the job of philosophy is to link these propositions into arguments, and that uh, third, derives certain conclusions from these arguments, which themselves will be propositional, and taken together they will express some sort of uh, philosophical view or position, and so forth. All right, now, how does one respond to this? As I say, I, I suspect that this would be the basis, if you spelled it out, of the majority of, of my colleagues in my department to uh, going forward with the proposal uh, that my student had brought to me. And what would I say to them? Well, first I would point out that uh, there, there really is a lot less agreement about the nature of philosophy today uh, than this kind of model suggests, uh, however appealing it may be to, to philosophers of rather different persuasions. And, um, and I would say, I would also point out to them that there are specific agreement, uh, disagreements both in the, uh, both in the more the uh, continental or phenomenological side and in the analytic side and, and even among the pragmatists in, in America, for example, um, about uh, just this idea of whether philosophy is uh, somehow innately or necessarily uh, propositional. And I, I think that uh, there's probably just as much disagreement in every one of those areas as uh, there is a agreement. So, um, and uh, I think another issue that would come up in this whole discussion would be what is philosophy fundamentally? Is it, is it textual? Is it more a kind of activity that can be pre performed in various ways in different medium, or if it's some kind of more idealist sort of view or position that someone establishes. And I think there's very little disagreement, I mean, very little agreement among philosophies, even within each camp, about even this basic issue. So what I would point out here, really, is that uh, although uh, I think these objections lead to some good, interesting discussions, uh, I. What I'm trying to defeat, or what I would try to defeat in discussing with my colleagues this proposal, would be uh, the idea that somehow these are prima facie type objections. In other words, I would say that you might object to this project, but the basis that you would object on would by no means be self-evident to most philosophers, and therefore really not represent a prima facie objection. So, you know, I guess I would say to them, I'm open to the discussion, but I'm not going to let you just assume that you already know what the, philo the nature of philosophy is, or that there's some very widespread agreement about that. So, uh, so as, I, as I say, I mean, to defeat the prima facie part. Well, another way I've thought about this, of presenting it, something like this. Um, if you think, I mean, this is kind of a thought experiment, uh, if you think of the range of computer games and you start at one end where you kind of have a, the what we you're loosely calling a computer game now, but it winds up being simply interactive hypertext. That would be one extreme. I think most of my colleagues would have no problem with regarding that as a legitimate philosophical medium. It's textual. Uh, it's pretty, pretty much what they do when they read papers and click on links and so forth anyway. So I don't think you'd get any objection of that like that. And then you might look at the other extreme as um, a philosophical um, or, or video games that are really not textual at all. I mean, they don't have any Easter eggs uh, hidden there with little hidden uh, manuscripts or explanatory notes or whatever. In other words, they're more purely visual aesthetic phenomena. I'm not saying that these can't be philosophical as well, but I'm just kind of giving a characterization. Then I would say look, between the extreme of um, 
computer games that most of my colleagues would say, oh, well, it's, high, you know, it's, it's, it's interactive hypertext or something like that, then yeah, that, that would be fine. If that's what she wants to do, we're, we're open to that. Uh, I think they probably would say if, there, if, if what she means to do is produce something like Journey or whatever, uh, that's kind of the other end. And so my, but my argument to them would be this, look, there's a lot in between you know, purely visual or, you know, the computer game is aesthetic objects, right, and the other as purely textual. And I see no prima facie reason why some of the games in, in the middle of those things, uh, of those two extremes, uh, I, there's no prima facie or a priori reason why those couldn't qualify as dissertations or as works of philosophy. So another way of thinking about this. Um, let me just very briefly uh, just say, that to, to move to a little bit more positive view, um, one might say, well, if computer games qualify as art and some artworks can serve as philosophical media, one might, uh, then um, it's possible that some computer games can be philosophical media. And I, I, thanks to one of my anonymous readers who pointed me towards Mulhall's work on film as philosophy, which I'd seen before but never really thought about in this context, so whoever pointed me in that direction, thank you. Uh, but I thought this, and, and this is, a, this is a, uh, the case that Mulhall makes, so I'm just quoting directly from him uh, on, on film. Film is capable of thinking seriously and systematically about views and arguments properly developed by philosophers in just the ways that philosophers do. That's the important, in just the ways that philosophers do. Such films are not philosophy's raw material, that's kind of like my option number philosophy and in, in computer games, nor a source for its ornamentation. They are philosophical exercises, philosophy in action. Film is philosophy. Well, I'm somewhat, I, I, I think this kind of claim needs to be limited a little bit, and I have a number of problems, but I'm gonna go ahead with my talk because I only have five, five minutes left. Uh, and just point, just point out that with some reservations, I'm, I'm sensitive to this. Uh, let me just move on here. Um, let's see. I wanted to talk just a moment about uh, some shared uh, devices that I see. That, so this, this last argument, let me just very quickly, is that uh, with some reservations, I'm sympathetic to the argument of, look, artworks can somehow serve as philosophy, and I think Mulhall makes a very good case for film, with, with a few reservations I would make. Um, but then um, the, the even more positive, so, so I think Mulhall is maybe making the case depending on how you read some of the rest of the book, that, um, or people like him, that somehow ph philo the philosophy can as well be done, let's say, in, in, in works of art like films, certain kinds of films, as it can in textual artifacts. But uh, I want to go ahead, and my student might want to make the case also, that actually there are certain things that are even resident in the traditional philosophy that computer games can do even better. And I'll just point out a few, um, and I, 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 they've been into, this is not a terribly original, but there are things that I've seen in the literature that was kind of trying together. One is examples and counterexamples, and that goes back to the time of Plato, who relied on those. I think that one of the things computer games can do is uh, present examples and counterexamples and do it do so better than just a text can. Um, likewise, this idea of thought experiments. Uh, I think that video games or pardon, computer games, uh, can not, not, usually you have this idea that when philosophers in textual form present examples and counterexamples or thought experiments, there's always this kind of preferred option and you feel like it's not a real experiment, they're kind of moving you in a particular direction and you're going to be stuck there. I think that uh, in video games, um, it can be much more of something like an experiment. I'm thinking of, for example, something like this, um, the Stanley Parable and, and games like that. Uh, I think they're probably better at presenting moral scenarios and ethical dilemmas. Um, I know that uh, when I played Bioshock for the first time years ago, um, and I thought I would know, having read a little bit about it and looked at it, you know, theoretically, how I would feel about it. Once I played through it, I think I changed my mind. So I'm not sure, you know, the view textually, I think I was, 
in one direction, having played through the game, I think I felt differently. Um, I think the philosophy has traditionally used a number of very reader-engaged forms of presentation, by which I mean things like uh, Plato's dialogues, Descartes' meditations, Hegel's phenomenology, uh, Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre, and so forth. There are all kinds of things that, 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 that the author continually tells you. You can't just read this, you have to participate in it. Uh, half of the work is what you do in engaging with this text, and I think video games are very much like that. So let me just sort of conclude with what I think I would uh, tell my student. What am I going to say to my student? Well, it's a guarded go-ahead. And here's the points I would make. I see no reason in principle why the project couldn't succeed. And I really think that uh, given some of these considerations I've offered, the burden of proof would be on somebody who would want to say no. I mean, it seems like it starts out that the burden of proof is on the student to say that, to make the case that they can do this. I think that's shifted now if anybody has, you know, followed what's happened actually in video games themselves and uh, in the scholarship about it and the analysis of it. Uh, I would warn her that there would be likely very serious differences among committee me members and that she would probably have to try very hard to strike a balance between a game that was, was too discursive, too much like a hypertext, um, and uh, too much, uh, too sensory and experiential. Uh, I mean, that might have, it, 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 to, to satisfy a committee at least, it might have to have some uh, textual element. Um, I would probably say that in order to do this, at least for the first time somebody submits one, she very well might have to uh, have, have supplementary texts. I've chaired exams in the, in the uh, visual arts, in our visual arts department. They almost consistently say, yeah, you can have an exhibit, but you have to have a written uh, sort of discussion of that too. And I suspect at least early on, it would have to be in that form of some sort. Uh, although the text could certainly be, a, worked into the, the, into the video game itself. Uh, and I'd finally tell, tell her on a much more hopeful note, I'd probably say that uh, at least your project will provoke discussion about the nature of philosophy and likely about your topic as well. At best, it will prove that there is a new medium for philosophy. Either way, it will be a, contrib a contribution to computer gaming and to philosophy, and it should be a good thing to do, and that's what us philosophers and good computer game designers should be doing. So, anyhow, thank you very much. I know I skipped over a lot of stuff. But, <laughs> but I did finish on time, I think. <laughs> thank you, Jerry. There are multiple questions. Uh, Pictures? Pictures. No problem. No problem. It's been, been, been done numerous times. Okay, so um, I'm asking you that because my PhD had video games in it. Right. So, okay, that is sort of part of my work. And I'm like, since we sort of established that we can use video games to an extent to communicate cultural values, to discuss and criticize culture, what stops us from using them together with other forms of mediation that are maybe better at explaining other things? So for example, and I'm just asking you now, why not using video games when, again, moral dilemma or spatial uh, situations are, uh, need to be discussed, and then text when textual, uh, or rather, concepts that are better discussed in text should be used. So my question is, why thinking of video game as the sole medium of philosophy, of the ultimate medium of philosophy, when it can already be integrated in a larger mediation of thought? Yeah. Well, well, I have, I, have, I have no problem with that, but, I'm, but I want to ask you what you said you, you, you use video games in your dissertation. Right. And did you, and, and, and did you, and they were what, embedded in a text? And so they, it, it, they, they were in a jacket at the end and they accompanied the text or? You asked the CDs for the video games for the dissertation. Okay. How, 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 did it, how did the relative balance of the, of the textuality of your dissertation play in relation to the video games? I mean, I assume the members, of your, the, the members of your committee had to play those games as part of reading the dissertation. Right? <laughs> to me, like, any, I mean, you can use multiple forms of mediation to convey 
Mm -hmm. But but it sounds to me what like what you're describing is not quite what this my hypothetical student is asking. What you're just subscribe what you're describing is something like with your first question what art historians have done for many years. They presented a dissertation and they have slides of, uh, in other words, they have slides of, of what they're talking about. And so it sounds like you've got uh, a, a, a textual basis and then you have illustrations in the form of video games. But I'm asking a more radical question than that. We can talk about it. Now, very interesting what you did though, because that could, that could be a halfway house that I could use. <laughs> with my cranky colleagues. And this is in the same way as well. This is very interesting, by the way. Uh, I also agree that there needs to be a textual basis. I feel very conservative and like an old fart. Uh, but I think it's important to distinguish between doing philosophy as computer games and student works. As I often tell my students as well, like, I'm not allowed to grade my ingenious interpretation of your work, uh, because then it becomes too subjective. So you need to have the sort of more objective standard on the side, at least, I would say. Well, that's the question. Do, do, you, do you need to have, I mean, in other words, do you have to have the text refer back or not? I mean, I think that, in other words, he's, the, 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 the first comment, I think he's writing a text and then adding video games as sort of illustrations of it. And, I mean, I think you're not, I think you're on a bit, bit of the same wavelength on that. Yeah, because how could you grade yeah. a game in that sense? How could you evaluate a game? With a, because it's going to be a large, to large degree yeah. up to your interpretation of it. And that's, you're sort of not allowed to grade it but, based on your interpretation. Well, there's a difference between art and philosophy here, of course. So as a philosophy dissertation, I would say that you can't do it. But I'm thinking, I mean, just, just as an, one example, um, I, think, I think with some, mo with some modding, I, and I would not, uh, particularly suggest that my student uh, submits a modded, already existing game as a dissertation. That could get into all kinds of legal problems. But if you, if you took something like the Stanley Parable and did some tweaks or, or used that as an example and then said, okay, I want to do a dissertation on, uh, on, on free will and determinism. You see what I'm saying? And then did it in a certain way. Would, would one need text with that? One, one could just say the student might say to me, look, the it'll have text, but the text will be the discussion it generates after the committee has played it. That, that will be the text. I mean, in a, in a way that Plato might say about the dialogues, look, you know, I'm giving you a framework to generate discussion. The real text of the, of the Theotetus or something is going to be the discussion that it generates for the next 2,000 years. I don't know. I mean, is that, is, that, is that a legitimate image of philosophy that would qualify as a dissertation? That's, that's, it's a tough question. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the brilliant question. I think it was a brilliant question you opened with. Um, and I just want to add uh, that Columbia University awarded a PhD, a doctoral thesis, based on a graphic novel this year. And it was in education. And it was about the distinction between text and image. And it, mm -hmm. it, it argued about the... Uh, uh, so, so if the medium itself makes a case for the medium, it's a brilliant thing. And I think they were really brave to do that. But I, I, I absolutely think it will happen in computer games as well, that somebody just submits a game without text, without written Well, after text. graphic novels, that is the next step, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much convinced. And yeah. thanks. Thanks for the talk. Time for one more short question. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Very interesting, well organized. I, my question was, you started off talking about um, some objections philosophers might have that this was not based in a natural language. And it seems like most, if not all, of your argument was about if something other than natural language could be used for a dissertation. That is, it didn't seem that computer games were unique in any aspect. So I'm wondering if there's anything specific about computer games that would lend themselves to being submitted for a dissertation. That film, which you mentioned as an analogy or, or I, graphic novels or other things. Um, would, is our computer games more appropriate than any of these other non-natural language forms? Well, well I kind of skipped over a section on that and I have one section on the temporality. Why, why film and computer games uh, have something to be discussed together and it has to do partially with the temporality of the farm and the ability to unfold a, something like a, you know, um, a counterpart of an argument in time. Um, Another, another has to do with the, the 
interactive. I mean, many, many philosophers, whether they believe it or not, talk about doing philosophy and the activity of philosophy as opposed to philosophical texts. And uh, I mean, certainly, I mean, I don't probably need to point out to anybody here that, that, that one of the major differences of, let's say, films and video games is this interactive dimension. And so if you really believe that philosophy is, is activity and not just, ge not just generating propositions or arguing about propositions, then video games, I think, would have a, have a kind of a primacy there. But this interactivity is, again, part of a broader yes. of digital media. Yes. Yeah, could be, and I w and the and the, the other thing I the other thing I would say is that uh, computer games, in a way that film can, but usually awkwardly, uh, can much more conveniently, I think, incorporate text and natural language. I mean, you have dialogue in films, but in computer games, you could have, for example, I might think of if I was going to design a philosophical one, these Easter eggs like you find all over Skyrim or something that gives you historical background. I mean, they they kind of form a sort of a a hypertextual network of their own. And you could use intra-game uh, written and spoken language to comment on the game itself. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's possibilities there that haven't completely been explored yet. Yeah. Thanks. OK, I think on that note, uh, we have to thank Jerry for the presentation.